Today, I'm speaking with Ted Rubin, the most followed CMO on Twitter, keynote speaker, and author of Return on Relationship. Please join us on this episode of Substance. Thank you for joining me here today, Ted. Excited to have you on the show. This has been a long time coming, especially you know, being one of my good friends and somebody that I followed for a long time. And I do want to talk about some of the stuff that you're out there really evangelizing. You're looking at relationships as the new currency. But before we get there, I want to dig more into you. Because I think that's part of what me? you as, really? as you, not as a brand, love, but as, as a person. That to me is, and I think some of the people watching is one of the most interesting things because you've taken a person and turned it into, you know, a brand. And that brand has become something beyond what I think anybody would imagine themselves trying to be able to do. Mm-hmm. So you as a person, now, how did you get started in marketing? Well, initially, I was always on the sales side of things. Uh, I got involved in investment banking when I was younger from being a stockbroker point of view. Um, learned a lot about how to connect with people uh, doing that. Um, and, and that led me through a lot of different changes, training sales teams, learning a lot about that. And when I first got involved in the um, digital space was in 1997 with Seth Godin. And I joined them because they needed good, strong salespeople, but salespeople that understood the business because we were selling something that was new. It's not like selling a product that everybody understands or, or even something like software where it's just a matter of showing how it works. It was evangelizing something that was new and different. So it became more like marketing. And, and truth be told, um, I moved up to New York to work with uh, Yo-Yo Dine, mm. and I was living with my in-laws, which, you know, I don't know if anybody has tried living with their in-laws, but, you know, that's not really a lot of fun, especially my in-laws being like the Costanzas, <laughs> um, if you watch Seinfeld. Well, you know my last name's Kramer, uh, so I just I, thought I do I would... know that. So you uh, certainly understand the whole Seinfeld thing. <laughs> and so I needed to get out of the house early morning. My family was still in Florida. I left every morning before anybody woke up, because I just didn't want to be there for that morning screaming session. Mm-hmm. And Seth's an early riser, so I would end up at Yo-Yo Dine at 6.30 in the morning with Seth, and it would mm-hmm. be the only one's there. And Seth, I fortunately had learned enough to keep my mouth shut because I was really in the presence of brilliance Mm -hmm. and and a lot of new thinking that was coming along in the marketing space. And I spent a lot of mornings with Seth just riffing about that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that, a lot of that permission marketing, Mm -hmm. the whole idea of idea virus, were the beginning of of a return relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, Because again, at Yo-Yo Nine, we talked a lot about how important the relationships were so that you could then tell your story. Mm -hmm. So what was one thing that you took away from that that really helped to shape your career? You know, the most important thing, and it's hard to tell this to an agency guy, yeah. um, but that we, I learned it with Seth and Eric and I, was to go directly to the brands. Mm. Um, th- don't disrespect agencies, mm-hmm. but if you pitch something through an agency, especially when it's new and different, mm-hmm. um, and, or groundbreaking, or, or thought leadership, you're not going to get them to really uh, take, pick it up. Because mm-hmm. an agency's biggest concern is spending the money that a brand is giving to them and delivering what they want them to deliver, mm-hmm. rather than evangelizing for something new. Mm-hmm. So our whole policy at Iodine was go direct to the brands. And mm-hmm. what that taught me was, it, I also learned to really understand the brands, to really, and to build relationships. Because these all these brands, had, had, had agencies. Mm-hmm. So in order to really break through to them, you had to spend time with them and get to know them as people so that they would give you the opportunity to talk mm-hmm. to them about new things. When you were growing up, were you a salesperson or a marketing person? I was a little bit of both. I would have to say that it was more towards the salesman side. Yeah. Um, except that I was always the guy selling something new. My dad worked for a company where they were one of the first companies bringing things in from overseas. So I'm the kid in, in school that was selling the digital watches. So I had to be kind of both because I wasn't just selling something, but I had to explain to people, but this is really cool because it's got mm-hmm. the numbers and you can press the button. Or I was making pins in my copper kiln and selling it to kids to give to their parents for gifts to their moms for things like that. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, I really believe that the best salesmen mm-hmm. are marketers at heart. Mm-hmm. Um, they just know how to close. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the key to being a salesman. But again, what brings it all together, and I learned this early on from early mentors that taught me about it, sales, was concentrate on the people, mm-hmm. understand that they come before the sale and before the product, mm-hmm. and the relationship is what outlives everything. Now you turned your sales background into a marketing career. Yes. Um, once you got into that uh, and you really started to understand marketing, how did that change for you? Well, I'm not exactly sure what you mean change, but if what you're saying is 
it gave me a lot of insight into the sales process because now I, I have the background of understanding what a sales team needs in order, like marketing is great, mm -hmm. but if you can't sell your product or you can't take the marketing and bring it together with the product and break down the silos, mm -hmm. and that goes into customer service as well because to me, customer service is also part of the sales process right. because the most important thing is selling somebody a second time. Mm -hmm. Frequency of purchase, uh, lifetime value of a customer, all these things, and the way that happens is first you market to them and get their interest, then you close them on the sale, mm -hmm. and then you have customer service that completes that whole Mm -hmm. process. So I think it gave me a lot of insight into things that a lot of other people didn't have. And it also taught me how to do, a lot of marketers don't know how to deal with people. Mm -hmm. They sit in rooms, they put stuff up on whiteboards, they come up with ideas, mm -hmm. then they pitch it from behind the camera. Right. Instead of face to face, where you really have to get to know people and yep. understand them and learn to listen. And what I like to say is that not just listen, but hear. And I get corrected on that a lot by people that are into the proper grammar or the English language, and they say, no, it's not just hear, but listen. But I take you know, issue with that. I like it the other way around. The expression is, you know, are you hearing me? Mm -hmm. And to me, that everybody can listen, but unless you're really letting it come in, and to me, hearing is when I'm letting it absorb me. Mm -hmm. And I think as a salesman, you really learn that. At least the good salesmen understand that if you're not, if you're talking too much, Mm -hmm. and you're not letting the prospect do most of the talking and give you information, then you're missing out on a lot. Right. And that's, I think, where marketers, and, that, and that's what, what has brought social marketing into all this, is that yeah. there's so much listening to be done, mm -hmm. but marketers aren't used to listening. They're used to sitting in rooms, coming up with ideas, and saying, this is what people are gonna like. One of the things that I want to talk to you about is being a salesperson for the first part of your life, the going into marketing, really helping to bridge the two. That is one of the core things that companies have always had a problem with. Mm -hmm. Now enter social media. Now you take a marketing and sales driven organization and you try to put social layer on top of that. How do you build the best of all worlds to bring those things together? If we had that answer, we wouldn't be wasting our time here in the studio. We'd be just going out, selling it off to everybody, productizing it and getting it done. The problem is, is that it's different for every organization. Um, every company is built differently. Um, uh, to me, the real key is understanding that everything we do is social. You know, I don't really love the word social media or social marketing. I know that social media is an important word because it describes platforms and the media that's produced there. But truth be told, what we're doing is socializing. And when you call it, what's happened is that social media is really something. We've started calling the whole industry social media when it really isn't. So, you know, social has to do with everything we do. And when we start understanding that there can be a social shell around everything, whether it's our vendors, whether it's resource acquisition, whether it's um, customer service, HR, there's all these different places where we can be just getting so much more intelligence, sharing so much more information, and communicating with people and letting them understand that it's okay to know about each other and it's okay to share. That to me, that's what brings it all together. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, look, it goes back to the whole silo issue of sales teams working on their own and just expecting marketing to be a support for them mm -hmm. or a launching pad instead of integrating the two together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, I do that naturally because it's just where I come from. Mm -hmm. I, I also had my own businesses and so I had to do the marketing and the sales and the customer service and answer the phones late at night and, mm -hmm. you know, all those kind of things. So sometimes it's hard to describe that to people, but it also depends on the organization. Mm -hmm. And a lot of companies are set up in a way that it's almost impossible to get that done. So there has to be a whole new mindset for business, mm -hmm. I mean, and companies have to start rethinking what they're doing with their entire companies. Now, a company that's doing a great job with that is Adobe, and there are some great case studies on that where they have empowered their employees to power their, their social outreach, their customer service, their just about everything mm -hmm. um, when it comes to companies talking to them, finding out information about them, and doing business with them. Mm -hmm. Um, I agree, and I've had the same experience with Adobe. I can see how they've empowered their employees to be able to interact. So how do you take a company like that? What do you think happened inside of Adobe to enable social engagement to be open and transparent, but still on brand? Well, I'm not an expert in Adobe. I mean, my, the way I learned about it is probably the same way you initially learned about it was by having personal experiences, which is a lot of what I talk about in social, mm -hmm. um, whether it's brands or companies and how they interact in social. It's not that I did an analysis. Mm -hmm. It's because I live my life. I'm a, I'm a divorced dad. I have two mm -hmm. teenage daughters. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things come up, whether it's travel. I also travel a lot for business. With Adobe, it was downloading Photoshop for my daughter mm -hmm. and having a problem and having to interact with the company. Sure. Uh, uh, subsequently to that, I have looked a little bit into Adobe. Um, 
Um, there's a great book by Cheryl Burgess where she mentions and gets a little bit deeper into what really mm -hmm. happened at Adobe. Mm -hmm. But from what I understand is that at a very high level, their chief marketing officer got buy-in from the C-suite mm -hmm. to reorganize the company mm -hmm. um, and the way they do marketing and the way they interact with people. And it really has to start at the top. Mm -hmm. Although... I will say that if you wait for it to start at the top, that might never happen. Therefore, I believe that, that employees in a company have to evangelize the fact mm -hmm. that this is a valuable place to be and that they want to be able to do these things. Right. And you know, I call it starting a revolution of mm -hmm. employees. Mm -hmm. That's saying that we want to be able to um, um, brainstorm freely. We want to be able to innovate. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to doodle at work, at daydream, and, and, and be innovative the way kids are naturally. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that can start at the bottom as a movement, the way it does in any company or a, a, any country. Right. Let me shift gears a little bit. I want to talk about one thing that I think you have hit on the head. Um, I call uh, it looking people in the eye digitally. Looking people in the eye digitally. Thank you. What? How did you come up with that? I'm a connector. And, and I, I'm all about relationships, and I'm talking about return on relationship and engaging people and interacting with them online. And to me, what it is, is I think that people don't understand that digitally, you need to start doing a lot of what you do in, in regular life. So what do you learn first thing when you, you know, go on your first appointment or your first date or you, you go for an interview is just to look the person in the eye that you're talking mm -hmm. to. Show them that you're paying attention, mm -hmm. that you care. I mean, we've all learned that if we do that at home, we're gonna have better relationships with our wives if we just pay attention to them and not look over their shoulder at the ESPN scores. Mm -hmm while we're making believe we're paying attention to their questions. So for me, I realized there has to be a way to do this digitally, and I was just doing it naturally. I look at people's profiles. I call them by name. You know, a lot of it comes from one of my favorite books, which I call the best social media book ever written, mm -hmm. and, and that most people will never guess the name, but the clue is it was written in 1936, mm -hmm. and it's called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Great book. And Dale talks about calling people by name. The most beautiful word to any person in any language is the sound of their own name. Mm -hmm. So it's so simple on, on, on social. When you reply to a tweet, when you thank someone for sharing, call them by name. Mm -hmm. If their name isn't listed, dig into their profile and get it. On the mm -hmm. other side, make your name easily available. Mm -hmm. So I can call you by name without too much hard work. Look at someone's profile. Mention something about the town they live in. Mm -hmm. The first thing that I was taught when I was in sales and I would go in a meeting was make sure the first thing you do is look around the office of the person that you're meeting with. Look around the, the, the whole office. Mm -hmm. Try to get a feel for who this person is. Do they have kids? Do they like to play golf? Are they into fishing? Because it gives you a way to connect with people mm -hmm. on a level of something that is interesting to them. Mm -hmm. So when you mention something about somebody's kids or their fishing trip, it's the best way to connect. I always want to know what someone's interests are. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully, because I, I've tried to open myself up to a lot of different interests, I can chat with them about that or mention how cool it is skiing. Or So if I notice someone's from Park City, when I thank them for sharing something or thank them for a retweet, I'll say, love skiing. Mm -hmm. And they know now that I noticed they were from Park City. Mm -hmm. So that's what I call looking people in the eye digitally. It's Great. getting to know them a little bit. And I know we're, that, that what's really important mm -hmm. is also taking the time every once in a while as a company to looking at the profiles of the people that follow you. Sure. So you're the most followed CMO on social media, I believe. I believe is on Twitter, on is, Twitter. Is, where, is where that comes up, and that's by Social Media Marketing Magazine. Okay. So hopefully they're right. So obviously you're active. Is this something that every executive needs to do? in order to be successful? I don't think they necessarily have to do it the way I do it. Um, it doesn't have to be your goal to be the most followed CMO on Twitter. That's because um, it comes to me naturally. It's what I like to do. I'm a communicative person. I like to be responsive. Um, I think everybody in the C-suite needs to be paying attention to the social media platforms. Mm -hmm. I think at the very least, they have to be reading tweets on Twitter. Mm -hmm. You know, I get guys who say, well, I'm not going to do that. I say, don't do it. But get on Twitter. Read tweets every morning. Mm -hmm. Read, you know, use tools that allow you to search keywords about your business, about mm -hmm. competitors, about other things, and read what's going on. This is mm -hmm. current events. Right. This, is, this should be just like opening up the Wall Street Journal in the morning for someone at a high level in a company. Mm -hmm. They should be looking at what's happening in real-time media and what kind of conversation is going on. So you don't have to be in it yourself necessarily, but at the very least, you need to be a lurker. So let's change paths here for a quick second and talk about who you want to meet that you have not met yet. Who do you idolize? Who is your, like, man, if I could do it the way that that person does it, because obviously you're setting a trend yourself. Now, who sets a trend for you? You know, I don't really know if there's someone directly that sets a trend for me or somebody that I idolize in that sure. respect, but certainly I would love to meet Richard Branson. Mm -hmm. I mean, here's a guy that's just done remarkable things. Um, people say amazing things about him as a person mm -hmm. uh, and, and how he interacts with people and just the brilliance of what he's done. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's someone I'd love to meet. Mm -hmm. um, well, guess what? 
<laughs> we have. I'm kidding. Sorry. Oh, really? <laughs> that would be amazing. No, no. I, you know, it, there's there's other people along the way. It, it's hard to come up with somebody. Like, I don't think there's somebody that I look at every day and say, this is the person that I want to meet. I'd love to meet Tom Hanks. Mm -hmm. um, I think he is a remarkable guy. I don't look at him. I really don't even view him as an actor so much as mm -hmm. a as a marketer, mm -hmm. as a business per person. Another person I really respect and admire, but I've been fortunate enough to spend time with him. I mean, Seth Godin. I think mm -hmm. that's somebody that a really cool guy to meet and a really cool, cool guy to talk to. Um, I just love to hear the way his mind goes and the directions they go when he starts riffing on things because that's really the best time mm -hmm. to hear things that he does. And I hope that I've kind of learned from that because I try to go in that direction, just not necessarily talk exactly about what you were supposed to talk about, mm -hmm. but let the flow of the conversation go with the thought process. Everyone that you just named really sets rules around what they're willing to do and what they're not. Right. I mean, Seth Godin, he sets more rules around what he's willing to do and what he isn't, and we've talked about that. Is that what is going to be needed in order to be successful now in the new social digital age? You know, I don't know. Seth's a special person. Seth's all about content production, all about the, the thought leadership, and, and it's what he loves to do. Mm. So like what he likes to say is it's not like, it, it's not, people will say, how do you cook? accomplish so much content production. He says, because I don't do anything else. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't go on meetings. I don't have coffee. I don't have lunch. I don't do those things. Whereas for me, that's the important part of what I do. That's mm -hmm. what I do best. Mm -hmm. I take meetings. I love people to serendipitously reach out and I'll say, sure, let's meet. It's happening right now in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I'm here. I have some gaps in my schedule. People say, I make sure on Twitter and on social media, on Facebook to let people know where I am. And now all of a sudden I'm getting people reaching out saying, hey, can we get together? Mm -hmm. And I'll get back and say, hey, I can do three o'clock tomorrow in, 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 at the Hilton San Francisco. Mm -hmm. You know, Meet me there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these things happen. And I love those serendipitous get-togethers. I find that some of the best thinking comes out of it. And it's part of my personal brand about building relationships. I mm -hmm. want to be available for that. So it's hard. It's a challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, Part of my personal brand is responsiveness. Keeping up with all the tweets and all the social is hard. Mm -hmm. You know, Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, for a long time, was known for replying to everybody. I know he doesn't anymore. And he makes it clear. It's just it, he can't keep up, mm -hmm. you know, I'm doing my best to do that. And and I think people understand that when you miss some things, but if they know that that's the vein or, 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 or primary thing you do, mm -hmm. they give you credit for it, even when you can't keep up all the way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I hope I can keep doing that. How, in the last five years, you have obviously uh, built a great brand around yourself and around Collective Bias and some previous brands that you were CMO of. What's next for you? What are you going to do in the next two years? And what do you see then out of that. You know, I'm not really sure. You know, right now I left Collective Bias the end of August. Um, it was a it was a great experience. I love what they do. Uh, I helped build their brand. Uh, their brand was unknown when I joined them. I accomplished my goal over three years without pitching Collective Bias. I built the Collective Bias brand by by building wrapping their brand around return on relationship, around looking people in the eye digitally, around content being the ad, you know, because content is what they do, I got people to really know who they are. Mm -hmm. So I, I basically proved that model, and I'm very excited about that. Um, for myself, and the way my brand has grown, has been very organic. Like, I have not made a five-year plan. I have not made a one-year plan. Mm -hmm. What I do is I try to be myself. I try to be authentic. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't ask a lot of people to do things for me. I just try to do for others without mm -hmm. expectation of anything in return. Mm -hmm. And then people rally around you. So right now, I'm just... Um, I'm, I thought I'd be taking a breath, but instead I'm working t three times as hard, mm -hmm. um, trying to keep up with all the incoming of people that are interested in doing something. Um, uh, there's a good bet I'll stay independent. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm working for a lot of different companies right now. I've been approached by a lot of brands. Uh, we're going to see where it goes. Mm -hmm. um, what I will continue to do is to build the Ted Rubin brand as, as what I'm passionate about, mm -hmm. which is building relationships, engaging with people, staying responsive as I can, and doing everything I can to help other people. And a big part of who I am is that divorced dad, that guy that my daughters are everything to me. Uh, I don't get to see them all the time, and I do my best to let them know that I'm just always there for them and love them unconditionally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, let's see what happens. Uh, I've had some exciting talks with you here now. Uh, we're talking about a lot of things for the future and how we can work together, so who knows? We'll see where it goes. Ted, thank you so much for joining me here today. I'm really excited to have you here on the show. It's been a long time coming. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Well, other than the fact that I love being here and I would love to come back another time and continue the conversation, I just want to make sure that you and anybody listening to this remembers that relationships are like muscle tissue. The more you engage them, stronger and more valuable they become. <laughs>